Hello and welcome to the voice studio with me, Chris Harknett. And today we're going to be looking at and analysing the Lady Macbeth soliloquy from Macbeth, Act 1, Scene 5, the speech beginning, The Raven Himself is Horse. Now, just to be clear, this video is about analysis. If you want to actually see the monologue being performed, then I'll put a link in the description below so that you can go and see that. So before we move on to the language of the soliloquy, let's first of all get a bit of context, particularly about the women of the Elizabethan period. So in Elizabethan times, there were still very much defined gender roles. For example, you would never catch a woman in the Elizabethan armies. Women were mainly uh, supposed to take care of the home and to produce children and you know, really keep the family unit together which is going to be very interesting in this play because, of course, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth never actually produce uh, an heir, which is a big theme in the latter end of the play. Now, Elizabethans wouldn't necessarily have been confused by a strong female character. Personally, I think Shakespeare actually has quite a few strong female characters uh, in his plays. And there were certainly female role models around. If we consider the two queens of England, Elizabeth I, who was reigning during this period, and then before her, Mary I, who was a very strong ruler. She very much tried to convert the entire country to Catholicism, quite ruthlessly, in fact. And Elizabeth I was seen as a very, she was a very popular queen, she was seen as a wise ruler with a good council around her. Uh, she was very much the head of the country. So the idea of a female leading character uh, would not have been foreign to the Elizabethan audience. However, the fact that Lady Macbeth often subverts Macbeth's authority, she often actually takes control from him, that would have been seen as quite a... Uh, very countercultural, very shocking way for her to behave. In this period, the man is still considered the head of the household. So that would be quite an extreme thing for Lady Macbeth to be so dominant at times over Macbeth. Finally, the next piece of context that I want to look at is the fact that England in this period, the Elizabethan period, is a land of moral absolutes. There is a clear sense of what is right and what is wrong, mostly defined by the church and from Christianity, which is a huge, powerful force in the West during this period. So although not everyone would have a huge knowledge of the Bible and its teachings, there would certainly be a working knowledge of the morality of Christianity. Let's start working with the vocabulary of this soliloquy. Why don't we start by breaking down some of the more confusing words or the words that are less well known today, starting with the word Paul. So this word actually has two meanings. First of all, it is a dark cloud. And second of all, it's actually the cloth that would be laid over a coffin at a funeral. So both of those meanings are very much uh, relevant to this soliloquy. Then we have battlements. So if you are unfamiliar with castle architecture, the battlements are the towers, the parapets at the top of a castle, which have uh, square holes cut into them in order that archers can fire through them, essentially. Then we have the word unsex, which I'm sure most people will be able to work out, but just to be clear, uh, this is talking about the idea of getting rid of the qualities of gender. So in this case, uh, Lady Macbeth saying that she wishes to not be a woman anymore. Next is the word tend, which again, you might be able to work out, comes from the word attend. So this is basically referring to waiting on or doing something for, you know, Lady Macbeth says, give him tending to her servant before this speech. Uh, it's the idea that you're essentially serving. Next we have the phrase, crown to the toe top full. This phrase essentially means to be filled from head to toe. 
Next we have the word direst. So dire meaning dangerous, meaning urgent, potentially disastrous. Next we have the word compunctious, which is essentially a pricking of the conscience. It's that feeling that you have when you know what you're doing is wrong and there's that guilty feeling there. Then we have the word fell. So this is fell as in fallen. The idea of something being sinful, the fall of man, or the, um, the evil intentions that Lady Macbeth has. And finally, there's the word gall. So this comes from the gallbladder. It's the substance bile, which helps us digest food. But as a symbol, as an image, the Elizabethans use this quite a lot, and Shakespeare definitely uses it a lot. And it's uh, used as an image of bitterness. So I would break up the vocabulary of this speech into three areas, really. First of all, we have words of violence. So these are words such as horse, croaks, fatal, battlements, mortal, direst cruelty, blood, remorse, compunctious, shake, nor keep peace, gall, murdering ministers, sightless substances, Nature's mischief, thick night, pall, dunnest smoke of hell, keen knife, wound, and cry. Lots of violent imagery here, or at least words that conjure up violent thoughts in us. Now you might have found others there that I didn't. Uh, perhaps you disagree with some of the ones that I've chosen, but for me those are the words that make me think of violence, think of cruelty. Um, regardless, there is no denying that there is a lot of violent language in this soliloquy. Next we have spiritual words. So by spiritual I'm very much defining both the supernatural and as well that inner spiritual health of Lady Macbeth. So we've got words such as spirits, mortal, blood, remorse, fell, peace, ministers, sightless substances, smoke of hell, heaven, and dark. All these words are associated with spirituality in one way or another. Our final category are all words of morality, of good and evil. So we have direst cruelty, remorse yet again, compunctious, keep peace, fell purpose, murdering, mischief, hell, and wound. Again, you may have words that I didn't spot there, or perhaps you disagree with some of the ones that I have, but we can clearly see here there are definitely three categories of words that Lady Macbeth is using here. So we have the violent attacking words, we have the spiritual, the supernatural and the spiritual well-being of Lady Macbeth, and finally we have the moral choices, the good and evil battle that happens throughout the entire play. So now let's look at the imagery of the soliloquy. Now I've really split this into two halves. So first of all, there are the images of darkness and of the supernatural. So there is a lot of spiritual imagery as we looked at the spiritual words earlier. And I can't think of any spirits in this play that are referred to that are actually good. Almost every spirit is a dangerous spirit, some kind of evil spirit. We have the opening image of a raven with its black feathers, which in most cultures is a sign or a symbol of a bad omen. This is true both in Greek mythology, which as a grammar school educated boy, Shakespeare would have known a lot about, but also the Elizabethan understanding was also that the raven was a bad omen. So it's like his audience would have understood, something that he would understand, and I think it's still pretty culturally relevant today. Apparently the omens that the raven is bringing are pretty terrible because he has made himself hoarse. He's had so much bad news to bring that he's actually lost his voice. Lady Macbeth often refers to the night, or blackness, or darkness, 
which not only sets an ambience, you know, night time is a time, it's the, the time of witches, it's the time where, you know, crime, more crime occurs during the evening than it does during the day. It's a time where you can't see properly because the light is out. So that image is really brought into this soliloquy to let us know that this is not a good thing that she's thinking about here, you know, it's, it's murder that she's plotting. It's an act of the darkness. Lady Macbeth actually asks the night to be so thick, the darkness to be so thick, that it actually is almost tangible. It's a blanket, as she describes it. And one so thick that she asks that not even heaven, the forces of light, could be able to see through it in order to stop her. She even asks that the night be so thick that the knife, the murder weapon that she's going to use, can't even see the wound that it's making in the body of Duncan. So it really is, you know, there is a real sense of hiding here, of trying to cover up this evil deed. Our next group of images are about violence and morality. Now from the very beginning of this soliloquy, Lady Macbeth talks about Duncan's fatal entrance. So we are in no doubt here that there is a very bad plan um, set in place. You know, Duncan is not going to be escaping this situation alive. Lady Macbeth uses a lot of violent imagery to make this clear. We have her direst cruelty, we have the fell purpose, we have the murdering ministers. And the night clothed in the dunnest smoke of hell. These things move her on. She's fueled by these violent thoughts. Her language here also implies that she's going to be the one to commit the deed, not Macbeth. She calls it my king knife, not Macbeth's king knife. I think that's very illuminating, the fact that she is going to be doing this. One of the things that makes Lady Macbeth such an interesting and complex character is that she clearly knows that what she's doing is wrong. I think both of the Macbeth characters realise this. Macbeth himself says in the speech beginning to be thus is nothing, that he has put rancors in the vessel of his peace, he's condemned his own soul to hell. And here we have an admission by Lady Macbeth of the same thing. She knows what she's doing is wrong, and so she calls upon the powers of darkness to help her through with this plan that she's decided upon. I find it very revealing that she doesn't want heaven to know what she's doing. You know, she talks about that blanket of the dark that heaven can't possibly see through in order to stop her to cry, hold, hold. I think that the fact that Lady Macbeth does have a clear sense of right and wrong really tell us what kind of woman she is. You know, she has such a lust for power that she would rather sell her soul to the devil even though she knows that she's doing the wrong thing, than to wait and potentially not receive that position of power, which I think is her real motivation here, it's what she craves. Finally, let's look at character. And I think there are three distinctive character traits that we can explore in Lady Macbeth in this speech. So first of all, we have her decisiveness. Notice that there are no words of doubt in this entire speech. There is only one possible option, which is to kill Duncan. The only sense that we get of this plan not going ahead is if somehow heaven itself can cry out, hold, hold, at the end of the soliloquy. Having decided what she's going to do, Lady Macbeth commands the spirits to fill her with direst cruelty and to stop up the access and passage of her remorse. She's trying to take away her own humanity here, her own human feelings of guilt and that might stop her from doing this task. There's definitely a sense of a character journey of Lady Macbeth because this speech is so decisive, yet later on in the play, you'll see that she is very much a very turbulent woman. She's a woman in distress with the sleepwalking scene and the fact that ultimately she appears to take her own life. 
The second aspect of her character that I want to talk about is her approach to gender. As I mentioned earlier, there are clear gender roles in Shakespearean's time. Women don't fight, so why on earth would a woman kill a king? That's quite a shocking image for a Elizabethan society. You know, perhaps that doesn't quite translate so well to us in a modern age where we have women in our armies and uh, very much our roles of gender are very much broken down. You know, there's no real sense of these are things that men do, these are things that women do. There is a lot more um, interlinking of what the genders can do. But for an Elizabethan audience, this idea of a woman actually going beyond the limits of her womanhood is quite shocking. That's why she asks her, the spirits to unsex her. She wants to transcend this idea of the woman maintaining the household and providing an heir and these kind of things. She wants to go beyond that. She wants to control her own destiny. She's very independent of Macbeth, which is a very curious thing, especially in this kind of society. You can definitely use this idea to explore the relationship between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. You know, why does Lady Macbeth feel the need to unsex herself? To me, that says that she doubts that Macbeth will do the man's role and actually go ahead with this murder. It's the only reason that I can see why she'd want to do this. Remember, she does refer to the, in the murder instrument, the keen knife, as hers, not Macbeth's. And thirdly, we get a sense of Lady Macbeth's approach to sexuality in this soliloquy. She refers to her sexuality a couple of times, but in this speech, most of what we see is about the idea of her as a mother, her as a woman. She makes a lot of reference to the reproductive cycle. She talks about her woman's breast having the sweet milk removed and being replaced with a bitter gall which is quite a shocking image. Plus, there's also the common argument that when Lady Macbeth is talking about making thick her blood, stopping up the passage and access of remorse, that she's actually referring to her menstrual cycle stopping. And of course, with no menstrual cycle, that means no children. So she is effectively saying that she doesn't want to be a mother. She wants to be this tough fighting man that's going to kill the king. And this is really shocking because, uh, as I said earlier, a woman's place in Elizabethan society was mostly as a mother. If you couldn't be a mother, there was kind of something wrong with you. So the idea that she doesn't want this, and we actually see by the end of the play, there is no child. She does fail to produce an heir. This would have been very, very shocking, very traumatic. And I think some of that still translates today. You know, biologically, women are the childbearers, men can't do it. So to hear these words of a woman trying to give that up, it's quite a shocking thing for us. So here we see the physical, the biology of being a woman is equated with these character traits, this inability to do what needs to be done, in this case to kill the king, you know, there are associations of gentleness and, you know, how could this woman possibly uh, do this horrible deed, which she has in herself. It's not just a society thing. This is in Lady Macbeth's own mind. So, of course, what does she do? Well, she asks the spirits to take that away from her. Again, this idea of not wanting to be a mother, it's pretty devastating in its original context. Elizabethans did love their children. They weren't like the Victorians where, you know, children were seen and not heard. Children were a part of life and a very important part of life in Elizabethan England. And this is one of several examples in the play where we see children are talked about as being murdered or harmed or threatened. Uh, you know, think about the, the murder of Macduff's family. You have the attempted murder of Fleance. You have young Seward getting killed near the end of the play. This is definitely a theme that Shakespeare is unpacking here. So we could actually say that actually there's a fourth thing there. It's not just sexuality, but it's also childhood as well. 
So there we are, there is my breakdown, my analysis of the Lady Macbeth's soliloquy, the raven himself, his horse. I hope that's been useful for anyone that's uh, studying this soliloquy at the moment or perhaps preparing for it. So my next video will hopefully be about how we take the understanding of the language and the thematic ideas and actually bring that into performance. So once that's ready, I'll link it in the description below. But until then, I hope it's been useful. Feel free, did I miss anything? Pop it in the comments. Um, I don't really mind being wrong. So you know, if you wanna pick out something and post it in the comments, then I'm sure that's gonna be helpful for people that are watching the video. So until next time, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.